GDC. Good evening and welcome to the GDC Micro Talks of 2017, where this year you find us playing with our hearts just because we're really utterly passionate about game design. Please mute the chirpings of your external brains and don't forget to use the feedback form to send us your love notes, your constructive feedback and your favourite cat memes. My name is Richard Lamarchand and I'm a game designer. I used to work at Naughty Dog on the Uncharted games and now I teach game design, development and production in the USC Games program in Los Angeles, where I'm also doing design research with a series of experimental games. So, what exactly is a microtalk? Well, this session was inspired by those short talk formats that use a peculiar and game-like constraint to help people talk about their deepest thoughts, their biggest dreams, and their brightest hopes without running over on time. Each of today's speakers has 20 slides. Each one of those slides will, be, will automatically advance after exactly 16 seconds, giving each speaker a total of five minutes and 20 seconds to let us in on their game-related preoccupations, prognostications, and wisdom. My hope each year is that the GDC Microtalks is a place where you can come to charge up your inspiration batteries, broaden your outlook about games and play, and walk back out into the Moscone Center brimming with passion for this incredible form of ours. Of course, you have definitely realized by now that I'm already giving you my micro talk. So, with just one more pause for a very deep breath, allow me to introduce you to the brilliant, interesting, widely traveled, and wondrous micro talkers that we've lined up for you today. Stephanie Bayer is Director of Social and Community Engagement at Skydance Interactive, whose VR experience, Archangel, debuts this week. Stephanie has a wealth of experience in community engagement, including work with Disney Interactive, Insomniac Games, and PopCap. Kat Small is a game designer, UX designer, and educator, and is the co-founder of the Brooklyn Gamery, creators of Prism Shell and Breakup Squad. She is also a product designer at Etsy, was a co-founder of the Code Liberation Foundation, and is co-organizer of the Game Devs of Color Expo. Darby McDevitt is a lead scriptwriter at Ubisoft Montreal, and has shipped more than 20 titles in 17 years as a writer, designer, and producer, including Assassin's Creed Revelations and Assassin's Creed IV Black Flag. He's also worked with EA, Warner Brothers, and Disney. Giselle Rosman is the executive producer of the Global Game Jam, as well as being the director of the Melbourne chapter of the International Game Developers Association and business administrator at Hipster Whale, creators of Crossy Road and of Shooty Skies with Mighty Games. Christine Love is a game designer and writer at her company Love Conquers All Games and is the acclaimed author of the independent visual novels Digital, A Love Story, Analog, A Hate Story, and of course her newest, steamiest romantic comedy, Lady Killer in a Bind. Stone LeBrand is a lead game designer at Riot Games and has also worked as a creative director for Electronic Arts and as a game designer for Blizzard Entertainment. In addition, he's a game design educator teaching at Carnegie Mellon and Cogswell College. Meg Giant is a freelance writer, game designer, and digital producer known for her game Samsara and for her work with Inkle Studios on 80 Days, with Fail Better Games on Sunless Sea, and on the forthcoming action graphic novel Shu Yan Saga. And finally, Bree Code is the CEO and creative director of True Love Media, formerly a lead programmer and AI specialist at Ubisoft on titles like Assassin's Creed and Child of Light, with stints at Pandemic and Relic, she's also an acclaimed writer and public speaker. James Baldwin said, love takes off masks that we fear we cannot live without and know we cannot live within. What a horrible year. So many of our friends right now are suffering renewed injustice and persecution because of their faith, because of where they were born, because of their gender or sexual identity, because of the color of their skin. Some couldn't get visas to come here. For some people, this is surprising and alarming. For other people who have been dealing their whole lives with the violence born of the racism, misogyny, homophobia, and transphobia that's built into our way of life, it's maybe nothing new. I've been trying to write an inspirational opening for weeks. Something, something, the ambiguity of play. Something, something, uplift people with our work. But for once in my life, I can't find the words. Maybe this isn't the time for my words. James Baldwin again. Love does not begin and end the way we seem to think it does. 
Love is a battle. Love is a war. Love is a growing up. We're about to settle into a wonderful hour of game design thought, and as you listen, I hope you'll find something in here that helps your heart, whoever you are and whatever you're doing. Our speakers are great, and I know you're going to enjoy their talks. I want to thank our wonderful speakers in advance, and thanks to Megan Scavio, Megan Bundy, and all the folks at UBM. Thanks to the GDC Advisory Board for having us back again this year, and to the amazing conference associates for their tireless awesomeness. And thanks to you, the MicroTalks community, both here and on the GDC vault. That's my talk. Thanks. So let's get the show on the road. I would like to introduce you to Stephanie Bayer, who has some advice for all of you who are either directly or indirectly involved in community management. Please welcome Stephanie Bayer. All right, time for memes and for me to go fast. As humans, we all have hearts. It's just a factor of anatomy. What we do with those hearts, how we express emotions, empathy, and feelings is how we begin to differ. While I enjoy robot, robotic precision and neo-retrofuture aesthetic, I'm still a human with a heart and must remember, expressing emotions is okay. In regards to video games, community management, and player management, that's where things can get a bit more tricky. I play with players' hearts every day, and as much as they sometimes tell me they don't want me to do so, this dance is required. But and this is an important but. If you're playing with hearts, you have to be a player with heart. Act one, we all have to start somewhere, and that start is the waiting game. Whether you're building a community or managing an existing community, deciding the tone of voice, discussion types, and transparency into development must be decided before a post goes up. Act two, how do you break through the digital wall? By listening and reading. Understanding the audience you're trying to interact with is key. Even if they are angrily spewing words on a screen, they're there for a reason. Now to just shape the conversation positively and genuinely. Act three, your first post. This can either mean nothing or mean everything. It truly depends on the state of your community and what you post. While main game updates or content releases can be written in the voice of the company, individual opinions and responses should be in your voice. It's okay to admit you're an actual human posting on a page. Humanizing helps. You're totally thinking, hasn't the internet and jerks screwed this up for us though? Let's never diminish those who've experienced the ugly side of the internet. Never pretend harassment on the internet doesn't exist or that people don't suffer because of it. But I still believe true connections can be made. I have hope that we can stand together, we can unite. Finding commonality in simple things can be powerful, such as the explosive pineapple on pizza debate. While it may seem trivial, it does prove the point that finding community can be as easy as agreeing or disagreeing on a pizza topping. Approaching an audience with a sense of heart means staying cool and balanced, addressing negative issues swiftly while still highlighting the good things in the community all at once. But still you wonder, how? How can everyone partake in the empathy game successfully? Some are gifted with emotional intelligence. Most have to learn it. Empathy is a skill that becomes better with practice. Though you're still dealing with the changing landscape of human emotion, no striving for perfection. Practice what you can, like active listening, microexpressions, and tone can help make you a more heart-forward communicator. You're doing posts, now what? Do spend more in-depth time with your biggest supporters. Don't stretch yourself too thin communicating on all platforms. Do realize you can only do so much. Don't try to own every conversation. Be honest and let the community know you still deserve downtime. Still too much negativity? I could spend lots of time on this topic, but here's my shortest version possible. I run communities on a two-strike rule. First offense, call them out and request respectful communication. If they still go ham, remove them. Don't be afraid to tell them to go. If their goal is to troll, you don't need them. Feel like you don't know what you're doing? Hesitation is normal in the beginning. If a reaction is negative, don't beat yourself up. Just spend time figuring out where your message is going wrong. Is it content, delivery, tone? Don't give up. When your audience goes negative, in most cases, a faux pas post can be fixed. So take a breath and then get ready to work again. Go back to act two, reading. Read the complaints, read between the lines. Really try to absorb the issue. Stay open-minded, don't get defensive. Pro tip, 
Pick a loud dissenter and a loud supporter and have a Google Hangout with them. Really listen to what they have to say, good and bad. Don't allow yourself to be abused, though. If they can't behave, end the Hangout. Take notes during the conversation. Create an actionable item list from it. Sometimes you have to apologize for the hearts you've broken. If you truly listen to the community and mistake was yours, sincerely apologize and move forward. But direct apologies are necessary. Create a post that displays an understanding of the community's feelings. Directly acknowledging them is key to regaining trust and making amends. Once an apology recognition post is posted, get back to business as usual. Remind players of positive stuff coming up. Feel free to highlight an in-joke in a post to show them that you're still reading what they're saying. Use digital icebreakers or pop culture posts to get them talking again. It may seem cheesy, but it works. Here are two ways I went hard forward at work. Innocuous content post I did led me to chatting with a cancer patient who I ended up bringing into the studio to meet the team. I reached out to the angriest grandma ever on Facebook and she ended up becoming a weekly tournament runner for our game. What can be gained by playing with hearts or sharing your heart? You can gain different perspectives on how players interact with your content as well as a reminder that players are people too. 98% of your players just want to have fun and have their joy tank filled while you're playing your game. You make content that touches hearts. In summation, playing with hearts is tricky but worthwhile. It's okay to help make people happy. It's okay to find joy in making others happy. It's okay to play with hearts as long as you're willing to share your heart as well. It may be scary or make you nervous, but hearts and passion are what build successful long-term communities. While not trying to promote unhealthy habits, if you ever speak to a community manager and they talk about drinking a lot, that's because the toll on their heart is sometimes quite great. If you see your community manager looking down, don't hesitate to ask them what's up, offer a cup of coffee, or even just say thanks. This small gesture does wonders for the heart. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Thanks for getting us going. And next, please welcome Kat Small. Oh, nice. Is that a good height already? Yay, short people. Cool. So one of the many things that I do is user experience design, or UX for short. And UX design is a relatively new field. Um, and what user experience designers do is advocate for users while ensuring that business goals are met by making sure that technology is reliable. So in terms of games, UX designers ensure that games interfaces are intuitive and that games are challenging while also making sure that they're not frustrating enough to quit. And game development studios are noticing and starting to hire them, which is awesome. <laughs> So it's very easy to think that one must be an expert to, to know how to create a seamless, intuitive, engaging game. But you don't have to be an expert to think about UX design, and it's actually important that everyone on the team is thinking about it. So here are several tricks, uh, four in total, uh, to start thinking about UX design. Um, and these are things that game development studios, whether you're a million people or one person, can use to make your games more usable and therefore immersive if that's your cup of tea. Trick number one, arts and crafts. So UX designers are known to carry around a toolkit of like dollar store stuff, including things like pens, paper, sticky notes, et cetera, because we basically never left kindergarten and it helps us to work better in the long term. So firstly, I usually start by drawing a user flow diagram, and that can be on paper or digitally, and this helps me to figure out logic before I get too far into the programming process, so I'm not building anything yet. So I can actually start focusing on systems design before I've started prototyping or programming. I also then proceed into drawing those uh, different states by fleshing things out again on paper so that I can visually explain my idea without getting too far again. So you can find that your ideas come out better when you're actually not preoccupied with the code or how things look. And all of this requires just three shapes, which are circles, squares, and triangles. And I just want to like really point out that you don't have to be an artist to be a UX designer or to do UX design because we're not making things pretty, we're figuring out systems. So trick number two is compassion. And I use this word because empathy is a bit of a buzzword right now. And I just want to uh, note what the definition of that is, is it's the feeling that arises when you are confronted with another suffering and you want to, mot to actually relieve that suffering. So in 2017, people are much less tolerant regarding things that take up their time, right? So you want to make sure that you're considering their emotions uh, when you're making design choices. So figure out ways to keep people engaged without relying on tropes uh, that cause frustration, like grinding. 
Um, and you want to also make your game worth playing by ensuring that every piece of complexity that you're putting into your game is weighed against the value that it provides. So usually what UX designers do is prioritize the most important features and either descope or completely cut out ones that don't matter. Trick number three is research, what hap which happens at every point of the design process. Because we all make assumptions and it's really important to kill those assumptions uh, before they uh, tank your project, basically. So I'm going to talk about three that I rely on as a designer who makes games. The first of which is uh, doing competitive analyses. So I make sure that I understand uh, the competitive space before creating solutions by asking things like, who's doing a great job? Where's their space for improvement? And how is our project different? And this helps to provide a great direction for us. Then I do interviews. So I talk to prospective players. And I, again, use that to help me kind of kill my assumptions by asking questions like, what kinds of games do you play? Can you recall a time that you quit playing a game and why? Or just watching them play games like mine. And then I get to testing. So once you actually have something built, you can start to test your ideas. And by testing those solutions, you can get data that helps to back the solution that you actually go with in the final version. And you keep testing until the product feels good enough to launch. And then trick number four is sharing. So one of the biggest things that I do as a user experience designer is kill the secrecy because people love to be in their own corners doing their own thing without sharing stuff with each other. But UX is all about transparency. So user, user experience designers talk to their team very often. They share learnings and work to ensure that everyone's on the same page. And they, this helps to let people communicate better and work better and deliver work much faster than they would otherwise. Next, it also helps you to get more feedback, uh, which is great because everyone di thinks differently. And you want to make sure that you're figuring out who your audience is. And that feedback can really help you because some of it's not going to be that great, to be honest. <laughs> some of it's going to be terrible. Um, and then finally, it also helps you to get more attention by sharing your progress with the public, for example. You can actually get people excited before they actually um, see the game or, or actually play it in real life. And you can actually use that for feedback. So that's everything I wanted to cover in this very quick talk. I hope this helps you understand a little bit about what I and other UX designers do every day, because every game I've made has benefited from my work as a designer. And I'm really excited to see us all making better, more usable games. So thank you so much, and have a great rest of your conference. Yay! Superb. Thank you, Kat. Next on deck, please welcome Darby McDevitt. Uh, just a quick preface to mine. Uh, I have a couple uh, hyperlinks on some of these slides. I don't expect you to furiously write them down, uh, but take a photo if the subject interests you or watch it in the vault. Have you ever read A Good Car Chase? I can't recall where I first heard this question, but I do remember having more fingers than examples. And though the question is reductive, behind it is the idea that every medium has its own particular expressive power. Books communicate with language, film through visual montage, music through non-linguistic sound. So when we consume a piece of media, its form acts as a filter for the kind of meaning we can derive from it, even when the content is similar. Modern video games complicate this filter by scrambling existing forms together. They are a multi-medium, often with no fixed source of meaning. Some games are novelistic, some are cinematic, while others flout all conventions. But most games do have a common formal quality. Because of their interactive nature, games are singular in that they communicate meaning through dynamic systems. And by interacting with these systems, players can learn how to recognize them, how to think about them, and how to change them if need be. We can call this heightened awareness systems literacy. Just as we talk about musical literacy or visual literacy or language literacy, systems literacy is a description of a person's ability to think abstractly about dynamic systems. Click. <laughs> In real life, the political and economic and social systems that influence our behavior can be vast, vague, and almost invisible to us. And when they break down or fail us in some way, we don't always comprehend the scope or the shape of the problem. For example, 
In the 1960s, French sociologist Maurice Duverger observed that two-party political systems were often an emergent property of winner-take-all elections in single-seat districts. In other words, America's voting system has created its two parties. Political scientists know this statistical effect, but there is little mainstream discussion of it, resulting in those who argue that strengthening third parties in the USA is only a matter of voter willpower. If we only voted our conscience, then we could fix it. But this is wrong. To produce real change, we'll need to amend our voting laws in ways that foster multiple parties. Unfortunately, this level of abstract thinking doesn't come naturally to many people, but a well-designed game could make this abundantly clear. And that's a great website if you want to see it. Oops. Desire paths are another common example of a lack of systems literacy. We've all seen situations like this. Desire paths occur when the system we design does not adequately serve the needs of the people using it. But this failure can be instructive. When we have a direct experience with dynamic systems, we can think more clearly about how they affect us and how we can affect them. This is Michigan University. All the walkways on this campus began as desire paths that were later paved over. As game developers, we're all familiar with this process. We design, we experiment, we test, we redesign. And at the end of this process, if we've been vigilant, we haven't just made a game, we've built a small system that can tell our players something true about the world. Games are good at teaching large-scale large systems in meaningful ways. When I play Pandemic, I don't just learn about exponential disease propagation, I manipulate it. And when I play Twilight Struggle, I participate in a zero-sum Cold War conflict. What thrills me about our industry is that we can take this process much further. We can explore political, economic, and social systems, combine them, and infuse them with empathy and style in a way that poses difficult questions. Does Bioshock's gameplay cr critique Randian objectivism or miss the point entirely? How does Fallout 4's survival mode fundamentally alter a player's behavior? Does Spore champion evolution or creationism? Should Bungie have gotten rid of Destiny's loot cave? As a novel, Papers, Please might have been one of a thousand moderately interesting Cold War stories, but as a game, players participate directly in an indifferent bureaucracy, which on its surface seems a model of efficient protocol. As a film, this war of mine might, won, might have won an Oscar for best set design and costume design, but as a game, it implicates its audience in the daily struggle to balance an individual's need to survive against his or her desire for trust and community. I recently played this wonderfully infuriating game to build a better mousetrap. It's a very sober look at the near impossibility of treating labor, laborers humanely in an economic system that prioritize, prioritizes constant economic growth. This is only a sample, of course. Consider all the subjects that would be best served not by a story, but through a dynamic system. Evolution, climate change, institutional racism, the war on drugs, mental health issues, even subprime mortgage lending. Unfortunately, we do live in interesting times, interesting and increasingly complicated times, but this complication can be offset by the work that we do. Through systems literacy, we can teach players how to navigate a world full of intricate and dynamic systems that are guiding us, whether we know it or not, into the future. Thanks. Thank you so much, Darby. Uh, now she's a little bit husky. Uh, I'm sure some of you are losing your voice after a week, uh, a half a week of hollering, but please welcome Giselle Rosman. I'll just check that you can actually hear me before Richard leaves. It's uh, my apologies profusely, but let's do this. Hi, I'm Giselle, and I've never been so nervous in my life. Thanks for inviting me along, Richard. I'm not a game designer, I don't even know how to make a game. But I can tell you about making spaces and communities both locally and globally. I've been a strange, you're not a real game dev person in games for about 10 years now. I fell into it through love. Specifically, my husband's best man offered me a job at a games educator in 2007. Things kind of snowballed from there. Australia's been making games for quite a while. The Hobbit, an illustrated text adventure published in 1982, is recognised as Australia's first major title. It was made at Melbourne House, 
where I also got started in games. From then on, we kept making games, some of them rather good. Most of them as work for hire to US publishers, thanks to our cultural similarities and the low Aussie dollar. It was a classic studio setup where it was all about NDAs and secrecy and silos. And then, and then the GFC hit, the dollar strengthened and most publishers pulled out of Australia. We lost around 70% of our industry between 2008 and 2010. Those who remained did so because games are their love and their passion. It was rough. Well, fuck. Let's go to the pub. I rebooted IGDA Melbourne in 2009 to make a space where at least we could commiserate and maybe even collaborate. Good things can happen at pubs. You can lose your voice too. At the pub and in the park and online, we learned we're stronger together. We developed a community of sharing. We realised we're not in competition with each other and our neighbours' success can actually help with our own success. Hands up if you've played any of these games. The App Store opening in 2008 was also a stroke of luck that Australian game dev capitalised on, but mostly it was classic guts and determination that kept us going and yielded some impressive results. Crossy Road would never have happened if it weren't for supporting emerging de developers and having industry veterans who aren't locked away in ivory towers. Thanks to a scholarship program, Andy Sum met Matt Hall at GCAP in 2013 and went on to form Hips to Whale. Through IGDA, Melbourne, I discovered Global Game Jam and Melbourne joined in 2011. As I got more involved globally, I got to watch, learn from and encourage some of the most diverse collaborations across borders, races and religions. The language of play is universal. Number of people across the world it takes to make a game jam like Global is nothing short of inspiring. With 800 organisers in a slack and everyone working together to, with their, for their strengths together, magic can be made. This year again was our biggest yet, and I'd even say smoothest jam. We came together and made good things happen, but it was also in some ways unusual given the backdrop of the US inauguration weekend, which looked a little bit more like, whoa. We made, we made games on inauguration day and continued while men, women marched, and it felt like the world burned. We did what devs do when we expressed ourselves in the universal medium of games. It was a nice shield for a bit, to be honest. The jam ended and reality set in, but my reality includes communities keen to organise spaces for collaboration, innovation and experimentation. We can use our craft to create our own realities and influence those around us. We can share our craft, we can empower and amplify voices. <laughs> Um, not always heard. Um, I want to hear those stories. I want to see them. I want to play them. And I want to make spaces and have them made for them. Here are my challenges to you. Lift up and amplify the quiet voices. This made me laugh when I was practicing today. <laughs> the underrepresented voices. Help them be heard and teach them the language of games. Don't treat the game's economy as finite. Your, your neighbour's success can help your success. So help each other out. You can share ideas and resources and support, it, support others. We, if, when we all make games, the pie gets bigger. Come and visit us in October. See for yourself. Meet our amazing and clever, clever talented games community that struggled and worked together to create a successful and sustainable sector. There's a few of us around at GDC, so just say good day. we're pretty friendly. Remember, we're stronger together, we're more interesting if we're diverse. Being part of something bigger than yourself or even your studio is the most wonderful and amazing thing. Share, care and collaborate. Thank you. Good mate. And Giselle, thanks to you and all of your collaborators for the Global Game Jam. And now it is my very great pleasure to welcome to the stage the winner of the 2017 Independent Game Festival Award for Excellence in Narrative, Christine Love.
Hi, I'm Christine, and I make visual novels. My most recent was Lady Killer in a Bind, an erotic comedy where you pretend to be your twin brother and get into a series of kinky lesbian escapades. You know, it's a game that you play if you're into experimental, non-linear, choice-driven narratives, but also really like cute tits. Okay, but uh, seriously, I'm the writing half of Love Conquers All Games. Before I got into games, I originally wrote novels and short fiction. I believe that games are an incredibly powerful storytelling medium and that when making games, the narrative should come first. And I'm sure when you hear that you're thinking, oh, so she doesn't think game design is as important as the story, right? No, wrong. Game design is the story. They're inseparable. Player interactions are how the story is told. So uh, I'm going to talk about the most important to me and very neglected fundamental unit of game design and storytelling, pacing. Everything else is just built on that. We've always thought about things structurally, but it's especially important in a comedy like Lady Killer. The best description I've seen of what makes comedy funny is simply doing what's unexpected. You can't subvert expectations without first creating them. And you create expectations by creating a structure that the player understands. If the player doesn't understand your structure, or worse, if you're just playing everything by feel while writing and don't have one, they get restless. They start anticipating the next choice and stop paying attention to everything in between. Worse, they get bored. You could just break it up by having lots of small choices, of course. Plenty of games do this. Long explanation, pause. But Hero, what do you think of that? This is bad too. It comes across as needy, as if the person you're talking to is desperate for your opinion. I would never do that. No, that's a lie. I absolutely would. <laughs> the kiss is only good if it's conveying character. It's weird if everyone cares about your opinion. It's meaningful if one person cares a lot. But in order to actually pull this off, you need to be flexible about your choices. In Lady Killer, we developed a unique dialogue system. Choices appear as they occur to the protagonist and they disappear as they're no longer relevant to the conversation. This gives a more naturalistic feeling to the pace of conversation and it also gives us a lot of flexibility in how we build sets of choices. Players learn quickly that they don't always have to say something the moment a choice appears. It's really hard to write for the system, by the way. We had to iterate a lot before we learned how to make this work. Here's just a few examples of some techniques that we discovered that work with this. So the first thing that appears on screen is always the impulsive response, the one where you fly off half-cocked. It's something that's always tempting to say. But it also leaves a player waiting to see if something better will come up. For example, will a more witty rejoinder come to mind if they wait? We tie these into the game system so there's a risk-reward element involved. We don't want the player to feel like there's always one correct approach. Sometimes waiting doesn't pay off. With this particular character, uh, the athlete, he's always egging you on. He's the kind of guy who will just dominate a conversation if you let him. And later on, he'll just straight up talk over you without even giving you time to interject. But if you're silent all the time, that's suspicious. He thinks it's weird that you're being so quiet. So in conversations with him, you can't be defensive. You don't want to fly off half-cocked, but if you don't say something, you'll never even manage to get a word in edgewise. The player feels like they have to be aggressive while talking with him. However, in other situations, silence can be a meaningful choice too. If you're quiet in a romantic one-on-one -on -one conversation, the person you're talking to will acknowledge that. Often, it's even treated as a specific statement. Sometimes it conveys uncertainty. Other times it conveys a trust to let the other person take charge. It depends on the context and it depends on when the choices appear at all. Or you can have someone who asks you questions one-on-one -on -one all the time and that comes across as being very needy. Suddenly it's a lot more meaningful if only one person does that. All these different types of interaction pacings tell you different things about the character that you're talking to. The whole reason why you have these rules is to break them. Think of the structures you're creating as a toolbox for emo evoking emotions. If you set up the player to expect things to go a certain way, then you undermine that expectation. It'll stand out more, it'll have dramatic effect, maybe it can even be funny. All this applies on a larger scale too. We build conversations out of choices, build scenes out of conversations, and build character arcs out of scenes. I'm not going to go into detail about this, but everything I've said about pacing applies to these larger units too. But the base unit is the interaction. That is to say, the story itself is built out of interactions and everything that you've presented to the player is just there to bring them to the next interaction. 
by pacing things in an expected way, they'll anticipate and look forward to the next time they get to provide input. Let the player feel involved because their anticipation matches the protagonist's anticipation of providing input. All those interactions, all those things that the player anticipates, that's where you put those things that matter. That's how you tell a story using pacing as your fundamental unit. Thank you. I kind of had a feeling that Christine would play around with the format and do fun things. Uh, please welcome Stone LeBrand. All right, thank you. I'd like to spend the next five minutes talking to you about heartbeats and games, but I'm not going to be talking about the heartbeat of the person playing the game, but the game itself, the underlying rhythms that are present in all games. Before I, start, before I start talking about game rhythms, let me first tell you a brief story about a rhythm game. As you can see by my upgraded controller, I was pretty serious about rock band drumming. <laughs> At some point I realized I should just learn to play real drums instead of pretending. So I found an instructor and started taking lessons. After teaching me the basics, he assigned me my first full song. Without any prior experience, I thought the notation was difficult to read, so I decided to fix it in my own way. I recorded a video of the song in Rock Band and ran it through a slit scan. This is a process that grabs a bottom row of pixels from each frame and then stacks them next to each other. It flattened out Rock Band's perspective grid into a top-down view. I cleaned up the raw output and was excited to show my instructor how I had modernized traditional drum notation <laughs> and made it much easier to read. He just shook his head and said, why are you wasting your time doing this? You could have been spending all that time learning to read real drum notation instead. Uh, so that was kind of sad. But all that time spent analyzing and notating a rock band song made me wonder if I could use this process on other games. Could I find a notation system that would allow me to see rhythms in other games in the same way an EKG allows a doctor to see and visualize heartbeats? One common timing visualization for games is called the game onion. This is a way of organizing player activities into nested rings based on time periods. This is helpful, but I find the circular shape to be suboptimal, since it makes it very difficult to actually measure time. I prefer to flatten the rings out into horizontal tracks, similar to a standard timeline. This lets me zoom in and out at the various time scales, while still keeping the overall sequencing relationships intact. Here's a real world example. This is the heartbeat of the New England Patriots football team. The season to season's at the top, week to week for the 2016 season in the middle, and minute to minute at the Super Bowl last month as the ball moved back and forth across the field. I was curious to see the difference in rhythm of the Super Bowl using the game clock of one hour versus the real-time clock of about four hours. Here you can see the gaps that are created by timeouts, the halftime show, and commercial breaks. Now let's apply the same technique to the video game Pac-Man. I chose this game because it's relatively simple and it has a strong rhythmic pattern. I hadn't played it in over 20 years, so I downloaded an emulator and I started recording my games. Here's the second to second diagram showing one of my early five minute games. Points per second, which is a rough approximation of the player's excitement level, is along the vertical axis. Notice the peaks. That's when the ghosts turn blue and you can combo them for bonus points. But Pac-Man isn't about just one game. It's a series of games over time. At the minute to minute scale, you play multiple games while it's slowly learning the patterns. At the session to session scale, it's not about the most points. Achieving higher levels becomes the motivating driver. Let's do a similar analysis of a completely different game, Resident Evil 4. This is a, thir a third person horror game that I played obsessively and I analyzed for the ETC's well played journal. The primary mode of the game is the campaign, but I had a lot more fun with the Mercenaries minigame. In this mode, you try to earn five stars on 20 different challenges using five unique characters on four custom maps. It usually took me about two hours to beat each challenge with five stars. In the beginning, you die quickly, but with practice, your score increases. Notice how the scoring system makes it relatively easy to get to four stars, 
but it takes a lot of extra work to get to five. An individual game might last about five minutes. The blue areas are when you score, or when you collect a power-up, and your multiplies your score for a short time. Your score also increases if you kill enemies quickly and grow your combo multiplier. Even though Pac-Man and Mercenaries are completely different thematically, it's interesting to note how they share several common low-level rhythms. The session-to-session -session growth that's caused by pattern memorization, and the bursts of excitement that occur when you collect a bonus item. I think this visualization technique is interesting for analyzing existing games, but I'm more interested in using it for games that are in development. By mapping out the timings first, and then tuning using telemetry the game appropriately to match the desired rhythms. I hope to give another talk about this in the future. So I know that's a lot of information to cram into five minutes. These slides are all available on my website if you'd like to review them at your own rhythm. Thank you. Two totally different approaches to game rhythm and pacing. I love GDC people. Please welcome Meg Giants. So yeah, before I begin, I kind of wanted to say that I feel like my talk is the evil alternate universe version of Darby's talk from earlier, by which I mean my talk is about goatees. It's, it's not. So John Scalzi once famously called the real world a role-playing game, but earlier this year I realized it's actually a free-to-play nightmare, demanding microtransaction after microtransaction until that final, inevitable, unscalable paywall. And I came to that realization about two weeks and five hours into my needlessly and almost inexplicably complicated adventure in attempting to re renew my Indian passport in India. I was standing in a queue in front of an office door for the th third time in two weeks, and I thought to myself, I should have just bribed someone. It would have made the process much easier. And I had this moment of clarifying rage. That is exactly the effect they wanted to create. Bureaucracy is grind. What I had seen as inefficiency, a broken or ill-functioning system, was actually working exactly as intended. My frustration had been commoditized. They wanted me to question whether it was worth it to tell the truth and pay the price, to buy back my time and my soul from them in increments, and as a game designer, at least around the edges, that felt so familiar. Many of us in this room have made a game that does this to players, or we know someone that has, or at the very least, we have played a game that does this. It felt so terrifying to realize that the same design techniques that sustain abusively monetized or designed games sustain institutional corruption. And it was a connection that I just, I couldn't unsee. So um, I didn't get my passport that day, but then I did go home and buy a horse in Elder Scrolls Online. Bear with me, it's relevant. So it would have taken me hours of play to get enough in-game money, so I paid real-world money for my mount instead. But that didn't trigger the same rage and feeling of being taken advantage of that I felt in that passport office. And that's because the game was entirely playable at my level without a horse. It was just slightly easier with one, and I was privileged enough to have five pounds, but not five hours, so I made that choice. So I want to be clear that I don't think that money Monetization is in itself a bad thing or always corrupt. Elder Scrolls stayed classy, I thought. So I believe that you can design games ethically and make money, but a clever friend of mine once said, yes, but maybe not as much money. And I'm not gonna stand up here and characterize wanting to make money as absolutely morally corrupt. I too like being able to pay my bills. But I do think it's important to say that many of the designers making games that do monetization and free to play and good design ethically have done so knowing that they could be squeezing more money out of their players, at least for a while. But the thing is they don't, and that is not an inefficiency or naivete, but a deliberate design choice. Exploitative design is a choice too, it isn't inevitable, and we are abdicating our moral responsibility as artists and human beings if we pretend that it is. When we use that excuse as designers, we are in some small but real ways training our players to accept broken and disrespectful systems and ideas by normalizing them. What we train our players to do in games leaks out into the real world. 
So there is a porous boundary between games and the world in which we live. Game design and the thinking that comes with it, all of these things are already influencing the world. But unfortunately, what is out there is the most banal. Game design at its most exploitative and capitalistic, reinforcing the worst practices, all sanctified on the holy altar of optimization. But I do also genuinely believe that we are a at a moment that is full of the possibility of change. A lot of people, so many people, that would have not had the vocabulary to talk about systems and institutions actually do these days because they play games. When we talk about a class being nerfed or overpowered, we're actually just talking about privilege. And so as designers and players, we are in the space of unprecedented literacy about systems thinking and design. These are the tools that helped me understand my own feelings of anger and helplessness sitting in that passport office. And these are the tools that I use to take that helplessness and turn it into a conversation with you in this room and outside of it. Games can help us understand the world and each other. And as designers of games and narratives and art, we have so many opportunities to completely radically reimagine how systems could work. Democracies and dictatorships, bureaucracies and social and cultural institutions, these are hard to change. And I'm really not here to suggest that games can change the world all on their own, but they can change how a person feels and thinks. We wouldn't be here otherwise. And games are a space, a creative, open, and yet, as yet largely undefined space where we can experiment with different ways of being, interacting, participating, collaborating, and competing so that when history asks us, what did you do in this moment at this particular time and place with all the possibilities available to you? I don't want my answer to be, I made a slot machine. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Meg. For our penultimate micro talk of this evening, please welcome Brie Code. So, I find I love video games, but my friends find video games boring. Cultural reasons aside, I think there's an underlying physiological reason why they find games boring. I think it has something to do with stress reactions. When you're playing a video game and lots of things are flashing on screen and there's danger and it's shocking and it's fun, that's a fight or flight reaction. Your sympathetic nervous system kicks in and adrenaline is released through your system followed by dopamine. And if you enjoy games like this, it's probably because adrenaline and dopamine are really fun. Adrenaline makes your pupils dilate, your heart beats faster, like mine is right now. Your airways open up and you feel exhilarated, you feel alive. But I think my friends find games boring not only because they aren't interested in more stories about white men, and not only because they don't know how the controls work, but also because they don't get an adrenaline high. They have a different reaction to stress. This is my cousin Christina. Maybe a couple of you remember her from a thing I wrote earlier called Video Games Are Boring. Christina is one of my friends who finds video games boring. What she loves instead are contemporary feminist art, vegan food, and longboarding with her friends. A few years ago, Christina was given a PS3 and I recommended that she play my favorite game, Skyrim. I didn't hear from her for three weeks and I thought she didn't play it. Then one evening she called me crying because she had accidentally killed Lydia. <laughs> Christina finds video games boring, but she loved Skyrim. She isn't interested in medieval warfare or swords or dragons whatsoever, and she found the controls hard. But she loved Skyrim because she loved the characters. Christina doesn't like being shocked, but she loves taking care. She loved creating her character, doing quests for other characters, joining guilds, and bringing Lydia along on her adventures. She said to me that it turns out that it wasn't that she didn't like video games, it was that she didn't know what video games could be. Christina doesn't like adrenaline, but with Skyrim there's something similar that was probably going on with her. It's called Tend and Befriend. Like Fight or Flight, 
Tend and befriend is an automatic physiological reaction to stress. If you experience tendon befriend, your body releases oxytocin or vasopressin when you're threatened, followed by opioids. This calms your sympathetic nervous system so you don't get the flood of adrenaline. Instead of wanting to fight or to flee, you stay relatively calm but aware. Your pupils dilate, you become fearless, and you are less sensitive to pain. You instinctively want to protect your loved ones and to seek out your allies and form new alliances. Oxytocin intensifies social feelings, and opioids feel really, really good. And the oxytocin opioid thing isn't limited to threatening interactions. It's also there when you touch or even think about someone you love, when you play fetch with your dog, or even when you exclude someone you don't like. When I read about tendon befriend, I was like, shit, this is how I usually react to stress. Most of my friends do too. Most women and many men have this reaction, but have you heard of it before? Maybe not, because it's barely been studied. It's barely been discussed. It's barely just been identified at UCLA in 2000. Like much other research, most stress research had been done with men and with male animals. Researchers traditionally prefer bodies that don't menstruate. Maybe everything we know about ourselves is wrong? We see these kind of mistakes also in the design of cities, the design of airbags, etc. And a games researcher once told me that his team also doesn't try to study women because, in his words, you can't predict women. This is really fucking boring. <laughs> a woman I very much respect, though, told me that you can't change the world, but you can make your little corner of it better. I'm bored of patriarchy and its lasting effects on my life, but I'm very interested in looking at the gaps in research and in design and fixing them. Are you? What is game design missing? I ask this question not just in terms of cultural elements, such as diverse protagonists, which are very important, but also in terms of satisfying game mechanics and game systems. I ask in terms of what we take for granted about play styles, player motivation, etc., about adrenaline, dopamine, oxytocin, opioids, and other reward systems about what it takes to induce a flow state in the player. Who designed these rules? What players are we studying? And who should we be talking to? And I want to be clear that care is not weak or simple or cute and doesn't only belong in simple or cute games. Caring for your chosen loved ones and the formation of new alliances are sophisticated actions and can be acts of warfare. Care is stronger and more interesting than brutality or fear. There's a lot to be explored here. I encourage you to question what you take for granted about yourself and other people and about games. And if you are underrepresented, look into your heart because maybe everything we know is wrong, but you are right. Thank you. Kat, Bree, Christine, do you want to come up here with me? We'll get started on our last micro talk of the day, uh, which was crowdsourced online from among our networks of friends and from you, the micro talks community. We asked for messages of resistance and hope, and here's what people said. All right. In times of great doubt, you might hear again the voices snickering at your heels. Games are a waste of time. But now, like every work of art, games allow us to see further and live a thousand lives. Be soft and open to sharing knowledge with those around you, especially the younger folk. Your wisdom will help fortify their success towards progression and excellence in their field. It is quite possible to create dramatic internal change with language and symbol. This change then reverberates into the outer world, reshaping and reorganizing it. You can use this. In good times and in bad, the desire to create and to play unites us as one human family. Every game is political. Keep making them boldly with your, with your head and your heart. There is nothing a tyrant hates more than the sounds of laughter and of play. Th 
the, the more you tighten your grip, the more the star systems will th slip through your fingers. Codem says, I went into 2016 being seen as one gender. Now I'm universally known as another. Trans people in games, you've done so much. Thank you. When life is becoming increasingly harder on the outside, don't forget to cherish your inner creamy caramel filling. Take a break from your work often and spend your time with good people, good food, and warm blankets. Make your games to show others what the world could be like, not as it is. In my mind, a lot of the bad things we currently have in our world don't stand a chance in light of what we are capable of when we work together. We are stewarding so much influence here, and I'm inspired by you all who live out of the fullness of that. Be compassionate. The growing gap between rich and poor is the root problem. Resist racism, resist anti-immigration, and fight for everyone's right to work. Be generous in prosperity and thankful in adversity. Be worthy of, trust, of the trust of thy neighbor and look upon them with a bright and friendly face. Be a treasure to the poor, an admonisher to the rich, an answer to the cry of the needy. Be as a lamp unto them and that walk in, in darkness, a joy to the sorrowful, a sea for the thirsty, a haven for the distressed, an upholder and defender of the victim of oppression. Never surrender the dream. These words are in honor of everyone who couldn't be with us at GDC this year for every kind of reason. Thanks to everyone who sent in their thoughts for us to share here this evening. Have a wonderful rest of GDC, everyone. Take care of yourselves and each other. Thanks again to all of our speakers and to thank you for coming. Have a wonderful evening.